Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Heard Over the Piano. Um, really happy to see you all virtually, virtually this evening. It's beginning to feel a bit like spring in Chicago after a few very cold days. Um, so I'm sure those of you who are tuning in in Chicago are excited about the change in weather and, and good things to come. Um, our guest this evening will be familiar to, I'm sure, everyone who is tuning in. He has been dubbed the gold standard of accompanists by the New York Times. His over four decade career has taken him to five consonant, continents, collaborating with the world's most celebrated singers in recital and recording. Singers the likes of Marilyn Horn, Frederica von Stade, and Cari de Matula. He has recorded for RCA, CBS, BMG, EMI, and DECA labels. He's an active conductor and editor and author, and is a distinguished professor of music and piano at the University of Michigan. And I'm proud to call him my teacher and mentor, and I'm thrilled to welcome Martin Katz this evening. We'll also be joined by my wonderful partner in crime, Nicholas Pan. Hi, Nick. Hi. Hi and to welcome, both of you. Martin. So nice Hi. to see you. Thank you Thanks for, for being that. here. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, the audience has to know that, uh, as Shannon just told you, she studied with me uh, not so terribly long ago, right? Not too and, long ago. Uh, uh, Nick Pond, of course, being a singer, was never my student, but um, we did interact a lot and have actually interacted a lot since that time. And there's a third member of this triumvirate missing, whose name is also Nick, and he also got a doctorate from the University of Michigan. So I, I don't know, is this what, what do they call that, nepotism? I, well, what is this? <laughs> Something exactly? like that. Yeah. <laughs> It's definitely a family affair, and, and I've neglected yeah. to mention that um, Martin has, of course, graced our stages at CAIC, both as a performer and as a master teacher on several occasions, and so we're so happy to have you back with us, Martin, in this, in this format, um, and looking forward to the next time we get to see you in person. And, and let me say, um, I am so proud of you guys for starting this this organization for keeping it afloat through thick and thin, um, for doing wonderful vocal and collaborative piano scene. And I, I just think, I know it's a labor of love, but it's still a labor. And uh, my hat's off to all three of you, truly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to make the smallest detour here, and since there is a Chicago audience, probably primarily, I just want to mention the loss of a, of a very talented and brilliant young man, Michael McIlvain, who left us about three weeks ago, three, four weeks ago. He was in the middle of his doctoral studies here at Michigan and uh, was stricken with an incurable disease. Uh, it's a big loss for Chicago, a big loss for me personally, and I just didn't feel right talking to a primarily Chicago audience without acknowledging the, the empty chair, that, the empty piano bench that, that has left. So anyway. Thank you, Martin, for, sure. for sharing that. Um, and you'll be um, pleased to know, happy to know that there was, has been a tremendous outpouring in the community here um, mm. in response in response to that tragedy. Um, DePaul has issued some st statements and um, some other organizations as well. So That's you are great. right that the, the loss is felt very deeply here. Um, and uh, not, to, not to stay in, <laughs> in kind of sad world, but um, we were talking earlier about just kind of what a difficult year it's been for a variety of reasons. And thinking about having something, um, something like that happen during a school year that was already extraordinarily difficult. That must have been a very trying time for you and your. It was, it was difficult for everybody. Yeah, um, but I mean, who knows the things people have gone through in this COVID world that that we're just beginning to exit now. Um, the the uh, announcement today of vaccinated people not needing to have masks anymore. I mean, I hope it wasn't premature. I'm going to think it was okay. 
um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm going to feel weird with people seeing my face, you know. <laughs> I, I know, need to I'm get a plastic to, surgeon on the phone immediately. Right? <laughs> I'm used to only having to put makeup like from my nose up and I, I don't know what it's like to do the whole face anymore. And, and guys, guys right. like me, we, would, we were going through three and four days without shaving, right. uh, which is not exactly professorial and because uh, we knew nobody would be able to tell. So that, that's all coming to an end now. How was it being on Zoom, teaching on Zoom all year? What kind of... Well, how did that work for you? Well, I have to I have to correct you. At Michigan, I taught in person all year, but right. it was it but it was difficult. You know, I mean, there had to be an enormous distance between me and a single pianist. And if if a pianist of mine ever was bringing a partner, be it a, a singer or a violinist, whatever, then we had to get a bigger room yet. Um, but it wasn't a problem to find bigger rooms because the big ensembles were not meeting, so there were there was a surplus of bigger rooms. And even my song class, which is one of my favorite things that I do at school, uh, as long as I limited the registration to only 12 or 13 singers in a hall that can seat 75, then they allowed me to teach in person. Um, still with masks, I'm, you know, the singers, are, everybody was wearing masks all the time. Um, but we, we made it through, as far as performing, I mean, forget it. I, I, the last performance I had was March 3 of 2020. And um, all, the, the, all the teaching outside of Michigan has been on Zoom, as you said. Mm -hmm. And I, now I'm, I feel like I'm an old hand at that. Uh, the only place I was able to go in person was Notre Dame because it's the place I could drive to. Mm -hmm. I wasn't emotionally ready to fly yet. And uh, they allowed me to come and, and teach. So, hey, that was kind of fun to do. I bet. That's great. Yeah. What was it like working with singers? So at, at Roosevelt, I've been working with a handful of singers, but I allow them to remove their masks, and I remain masked when we work, and we're also quite distanced in the room. So right. I haven't really had that experience of working with a singer who is wearing a mask while trying to do language and be emotive and all of that. What what was that? Ex has that experience been like? It, it that's that's been very hard on the singers. Some of them have stepped up to the plate and learned very quickly that they have to do it all with the sound of their voice, the sound of their diction, as much as they can get through a mask, mm -hmm. and uh, not relying on the lower part of their face for expression visually. Uh, so it's kind of like make D rather than a DVD. Um, and in a way, I think that was a silver lining to COVID for a singer because too many people uh, have been depending on how do they look, you know, and how are they tossing their head and all that stuff, which, which is fine if it's if it goes with the score if it goes with the, what the song is and it's certainly fine in opera but um sometimes you can really destroy a, a subtle song uh, you know what would you do with Nocturne Troima by Schubert which is all soft and all slow and you know you can't you can't sell the song with anything except your singing the sound of your singing um and that not every singer that I know, I mean, as far as a student goes, not every singer stepped up to the plate and realized that they had to think differently about their expression, but the, but several did. And that I thought, yes, right on. And let's make sure that that stays even when we aren't masked. That's, that's the main thing. Um, I think it also gave, I think it's going to be helpful for art song. And that's where CAIC comes in because we, we're appreciating more modest things now. You know, the art song is a modest thing and uh, the ring by Wagner is not a modest thing. And uh, I think it will be easier to get people to come to recitals now where you, you can only have 70 people in, in a room in the audience or something because we're coming out of this thing where we haven't had anything. I think it's a, a backdoor way to benefit art song, but hey, any port in a storm, you know, to benefit art song, as far as I'm concerned. So a couple silver linings, although the rest of it has been really pretty difficult. Um, 
everything seems to take longer. <laughs> wiping the keyboard, you know, wiping the music stand, um, the mundane things like that, you know. And it's like you have more time, but then you don't get anything done. It's, <laughs> it's very weird. I, I felt like that guy in mythology who's always having to push the rock up the hill and then it's back down. Nick, you're a Greek. You probably know who that was. It's one of the Titans, I think. <laughs> I love it. Anyway, my students, I have to say, to a person, expressed appreciation that we were able to meet in person uh, because so many, I mean, their voice lessons were not in person. Mm -hmm. um, hardly anything was in person. So I, I took that as a big um, feather in my cap, you know, or in the school's cap, actually, for letting me do it. We had a, a few students who gave recitals this year and, and were able to do them in person in Gantz. And I played for a handful of students and it was so heartwarming and gratifying to see what happened to them when they walked out on the stage and just inhabited space and were right. able to take off the mask and, and do things that they had not been able to do for several months prior. It was really, really quite touching. I think another silver, silver lining, I'm sure, Nick, you would agree, is just our appreciation for what we do and what we're able to do. And, mm -hmm. um, and I'm really glad you said that, Martin, about the, the role of song on the other side of this. Nick, I'm sure you have, have thoughts about this. You and I have talked about kind of just our instinct that audiences will desire these modest things, as you say, Martin, and intimacy and sincerity in the way that you really find through poetry and song. Um, exactly. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that's true. I'm, I'm sure it is. I, I, I'm very optimistic about that. That's great. So if anybody in the Facebook world has any questions, please enter those into the comments and I will make sure that they come to our, our maestro here. And uh, he keep, can it, keep it clean, guys, keep it clean. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, since you, you are with us and we're, we're kind of just talking about these silver linings and challenges, and I don't know if we've ever had an opportunity to talk with you about what it's been like as a singer in this time of COVID and um, what are some silver linings you've found through all of this, if any, if you're able to look at it that way yet. No, I, I mean, I am. I mean, for me, it's been the kind of sudden halt to the running around the world has finally given me some time to really strangely dig in deep to the practice. And so I've kind of tried mm. to maximize this time in order to do those kinds of things. And, you know, also it's given me this bizarre opportunity to sort of make a choice about what is it that I ex want to study? and. So that's been kind of a really liberating thing. And I think, you know, in a way it's allowed me to kind of have a moment to sort of meditate and practice and think and improve. And I mean- That's great. I, I, I would imagine Martin that you're of like mind. I mean, how have you had similar experiences during all of this? Well, um, you know, I've always said if, if my hands fell off, uh, I would go into languages, linguistics or something like that. I've always been a real language freak. And uh, the one uh, language that is commonly spoken that I never studied, although I've played lots of songs in that language, is Spanish. And I decided last summer, I'm not going to just sit around, you know, watching the clock go round uh, with no gigs and not a lot of motivation. And I started studying Spanish earnestly at a local college here. Um, and then I got a tutor who lives in Lima, Peru, and we have lessons online. And uh, I'm doing interactive stuff with Spanish. It's, it, it comes pretty easily when you know Italian and French, I have to say, and the diction of Spanish I already knew because of coaching and accompanying people. So I'm really loving it, except it has ruined my Italian. I started, one, one of my students has an Italian boyfriend and I, when I first met him, I started I wanted to show off, so I wanted to speak in Italian. And what came out of my mouth was Spanish. And so he, you know, that that sealed my doom with him, I'm afraid. Oh, no. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, that was, the, I guess that's the most uh, concrete thing that I've done to keep the workaholic in me afloat during this time. 
Um, I've learned some scores that I don't even have to play. Usually I don't have time to learn things that I don't have to play, but I've learned some scores that I intend to play as soon as uh, the curtain goes up, you know? Which will hopefully be soon, right? Yeah, yeah. Our musical society here, for your listeners, it's called UMS, University Musical Society, which traditionally has, I don't know, 80 concerts, 90 concerts every year. Uh, big orchestras like Berlin and New York and Vienna coming here and all that. It's, it's a, quite a prestigious series. So of course they had nothing for 13 or 15 months. And just uh, yesterday they announced their season for next season. And it's a modest one by comparison to what has gone on for a hundred years. Um, but that's what I was meaning when I said, you know, we're all going to appreciate um, a little bit of food on the plate at, and it's going to be quality food. It just mm -hmm. isn't going to be a buffet, you know, uh, all you can eat buffet. Um, so yes, yeah, things are things are going to open up. I'm sure our, the, the president of our university here, University of Michigan has uh, stepped up to the plate and has done all kinds of uh, town hall meetings with students, with faculty. We're pretty safe here on campus. The music school has had no breakouts. At, at, is that what it's? Outbreaks, sorry, not breakouts. <laughs> Outbreaks. Um, I think because musicians are aware that their bodies are their instruments and, you know, it's not like frat boys running around thinking they're immortal um, and playing frisbee with no mask on. That doesn't happen in, in the music world. So. Mm -hmm. Sorry, frat boys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you know, there's a Venn diagram overlap somewhere, but it's probably quite small. Like, well, you know, <laughs> Phi Mu Alpha, isn't that the music fraternity? Yeah. I know yeah. they get yeah. kind of crazy, don't they? But yeah, they the overlap they, in the Venn diagram. Yeah, they, they do uh, six, eight, and three, four in the same piece. Can you imagine? <laughs> it just goes crazy. Wild. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, we were talking a little bit before we um, before we met in front of everyone tonight, just about kind of song recitals and song and CAIC. And, and I think I mentioned to you that probably you are, your teaching and your leadership and inspiration at the University of Michigan is probably the primary reason that CAIC exists. That um, I think Nick Hutchinson, Nick Pond and I all are found ourselves missing when we left school, missing the environment that we had in school, which was one that really um, kind of highlighted the art of collaboration, obviously, mm -hmm. recital building, program building, creative recital making. And um, it was this beautiful little bubble. Would you agree, Nick? about yeah. just even just going to song class was was like a weekly or bi week or couple times a week, whatever, however you say that, um, little recital in class. The performances were always at such a high level and just always feeling like we had this, this incubator of, <laughs> of opportunity, really, of, you know, people wanted to do recitals. Um, and when we left school, I think we realized there really wasn't the, a wealth of opportunity for the recital out in the world. And so... Thus, CAIC was born, and so I wonder your wonder your thoughts about that. As someone who kind of came up in a career of playing recitals, what has that been like for you? This journey to just how it started, where it is now, and where it's going. Well, I mean, of course, I had no. Thank you for mm -hmm. giving me the a, a bit of credit for CAIC, but you you guys do all the work. I'm just delighted that it exists, as I said earlier, but. My timing, thanks to my mom and dad, uh, just worked out really great because the 70s and 80s and the first years of the 90s, there were recitals all over the place being given by lots of different people. And nothing to do with COVID. This is way before COVID and way before in even the economic crash of uh, what was it, 2008 or something like that. Um, the recital just started to lose popularity in the world outside of academia. And I could tell by my own bookings, you know, that would I would see 10 less or 20 less concerts than the previous season. And now I feel like we've gotten into a place where the same 
handful of singers are doing all the voice recitals in the world. Um, and I'm not an economist, but it makes sense to me that the concert halls are so big that the empresarios would be terrified to put someone unknown on that stage because then how are you gonna fill 2000 seats or 3000 seats sometimes? So it's, it's the Devo and the Diva and the Megastar. And I don't mean Diva and Devo in terms of bad behavior. I just mean a, a very well-known person in, in singing. Um, and that has, that has really influenced things negatively, I think. And it's impossible to deny that opera, opera and song are not only so different, but their opera is, is very popular. And people pay big bucks. Look at the tickets for, for opera tickets, you know, and look at the prices for opera tickets. And uh, it's difficult for a song performance to compete with the fireworks of sets and costumes and turntables and scrims and all those wonderful things that make opera and, and indeed all theater very, very exciting. Um, poetry maybe is not, you know, to be done in a coliseum, uh, whereas Toronto needs to be done in a coliseum, you know? so. I feel like the, the song really needs some resuscitation right now. That's what's so great about CAIC. Um, whenever there's, well, there's this group in LA that meets in the summer called Songfest. They're, you know, doing their part. Um, Marilyn Horn's song competition still exists at the Music Academy at the, uh, in Santa Barbara, California. Um, two days from now, I'm going to be judging the Eastman School of Music's uh, song competition. Of course, that's an academic thing. So that that doesn't really qualify because of what you said, Shannon. When you leave school, then suddenly that world goes away. And what does it become? It becomes playing auditions for people and uh, playing arias all the time. Listen, I'm a big opera fan. You know, yeah, uh, I love it. But it's a completely different world it, uh, from, from a song recital. Um, I don't know, should I go <laughs> keep talking or, or what? Uh, with, with songs, you first of all, you're dealing with literature. I mean, the I don't mean the musical literature, but the, the poetry literature, or could be prose, but the, the words that, that are much, much higher level than any opera libretto that I can think of. Um, because opera is concerned with all the things I just said and plot. And a lot of songs, I, I would say 99% of songs don't have a plot. They're about feelings and atmospheres and reactions to other people's feelings. Um, that's, that's a harder thing to sell and it requires much more imagination from both singer and pianist, I think. You know, when you, when you go out to do Mimi in La Boheme, you know, I'm seamstress, I live on the top floor, I'm shy. Uh, I've been looking at that guy downstairs. I think I'm going to pretend to lose my key, you know, what, whatever the deal is. But when you go out to do Nocturne Troima or Imfrüling or Selectas Langoureuse, there is no context. You have to create all of that yourself. So I would imagine that to the artists, it's sort of fun to be 26 different atmospheres in one evening. It is for me, I have to say. Um, it's, it's just a very different experience. And I don't know that it was ever meant for the masses the way the, way the ring is or Toronto, as I said before. I, I think we should uh, attract as many fans as we can and we should be assertive about doing so in as many imaginative, imaginative ways as we can think of without polluting the actual thing itself. You know, I mean, if you're gonna to have to have a hobby horse on stage when you do Mazorksky's cycle called the nursery, that's going a little far to sell that song cycle. But I think for the singer and the pianist, they could share the duties to talk to the audience and say, here's our take on what we're about to do. And here's what this poem is about. You know, people don't study German anymore and there aren't all these German immigrants, but guess what? Schubert's songs are in German. So, um, it needs, you know, a little more explanation. And I, I, I just love that lack of formality. Uh, you know, 
it was in the Victorian age that the song recital really became what, what it was for so long. And uh, this barrier between the great artist and the audience, and you look out and everybody's head is down reading the text and all that stuff. It's time to, you know, mess with that. Okay, now I've been talking too long. <laughs> no, it's great. It's, do you, have you found your, I mean, your performance approach when you're performing has really also become more informal as time has gone by? I mean. Well, yeah, it didn't come naturally or easily to me, you know, cause I'm a product of that other time. You know, you, you guys are what, 50 years younger than I am or something. So, but my students, you know, stayed the same age year after year, right? Right. Um, so I've, I am very influenced by what excites them and what stimulates your imagination. And it, it's contagious. Yeah, I think I am less, oh, I don't know, severe or <laughs> uh, uh, stiff or formal. I don't know what adjective to use. Uh, now it's just, uh, not just, now it is hey, let's, let's have a conversation with the audience. Some of it will be spoken and some of it will be sung and some of it will be played, you know? It's interesting, I mean, as, a, as, you, as someone who took your song class in the, what, mid to late 90s, you know? And, I, I, and then when I came and I mean, I think one of the last things we did together was coming to UMS with you at your invitation, thank you very much, mm -hmm. for What's in a Song, which is this wonderful biannual series that you curate at the University of Michigan, and, which is amazing, by the way. Everybody, if you are in the Ann Arbor area and this happens again, you have to go if you can even possibly get a ticket because amazingly, <laughs> it sells out. Um, which is an incredible experience, but if you were so charming from the stage in that in that performance, and it was like so wonderful to see this warmth, you know, the warmth that's inside you come across that way. And wow, I had such fun in those perform that performance because of that. I mean, it was yeah, you know. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, um, but see, that. that song series is done in a relatively small hall. I don't know what it, maybe it holds eight hundred. That's relatively small. Um, and it has, uh, what do you call it, surtitles projected. So there are no printed texts for people to look down at. Um, I think that's a big help. Um, and there's talking back and forth, you know, from the audience and, and to the audience, I mean. And uh, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be in perpetuity because it's been funded that way. Oh, it may great. not be with me because I don't intend to be perpetual, but um, it'll keep going. Shannon can come over and run it if she wants. I would Whatever. love it. I would love to come to one of the concerts. I haven't had the privilege of doing that yet. So you'll see me next season, maybe, or, okay. or sometime Thank soon. Thank you. I would that's, love to that's, come. It's a date. I would love to. I cool. would love to come. So first of all, Nick Hutchinson informs us that the Greek person we were looking for with, with the boulder is Sisyphus. He has chimed in. Sisyphus. On the Sisyphus, yes, he is. I, I always knew Nick was a nerd. He would know those <laughs> things. Um, and then we have, a, we have a question from Amy Khan. And uh, her question is, if it would stop scrolling up, now that we've experienced this year, what could you take into future performances besides the sort of recording aspect of, I mean, approaching things as a recording and this other silver well, that you mentioned? Um, I know, gosh. Um, students have learned so much more about technology. That's the first thing that comes to my mind because they've had to, they've learned. One, one of my students did the complete Italian songbook by Wolf and he, uh, but it was not with an audience. So he had four different singers. It was recorded four different dates with him and one singer. And then he stitched it all together in a performing order that he designed himself. And the, the look of it as when it was broadcast, uh, I guess on Facebook, right? That's how he put it out there. It, it looks so professional. And I know that this guy had never done anything like this in his life. Well, he, he's not gonna forget that technology that he learned how to do. And maybe he can use it for future projects, whether we have COVID or we don't have COVID. You know, that's the first thing. Um, and then uh, didn't we already talk about uh, singers having to be expressive with masks on? So when the masks come off, I, I am really hoping that they retain that sense of the, the instrument in their throat and their eyes doing the job. You know? um, 
I'm going to keep talking about that even when we don't have to be masked uh, in classes and, and summer teaching and things like that. What else have we gained from this? The appreciation of modest things because we haven't had anything else. <laughs> um, I don't know, time to, you said it yourself, time to think about stuff. What do I want to do? How do I want to do it? You know, learning, learning uh, a different metabolism of life, you know, and maybe it'll stick. We don't have to go back to the express lane necessarily, unless we want to. Right. All of which, all of which I think would be so great for art, you know. One hundred percent. You have to dig deep, and it takes time yeah. to do that. Yeah. I, that I, that I learned from you. <laughs> so. We also have a question from Elizabeth Schumann, if it's okay to pose it. Elizabeth up. Schumann, my God, yes. what a great name. Is she a singer? Whoa. She is, she is, lovely singer. She is wondering if uh, you have any favorite new songs or cycles or composers who have emerged during the last year for you. Uh, hmm. I'm gonna strike out on this one, except to say, that we've all become more aware, very much more aware of the composers who have been neglected. The BIPOC composers, the female composers, um, physically challenged composers, I suppose. Um, and I, I think everybody I know is going to make sure that that is not continued on his or her watch, you know? Um, keeping in mind that it still has to be music of quality and words of quality. Um, you don't want to fix that, that uh, problem by drowning it in, in lack of quality. But um, I just can't give you a specific name because I'm just starting to think about how I'm going to assign rep and whom I'm going to include uh, that I didn't ever include before. Martin A, a student brought to me some songs of Josephine Lang. Do you know, or do you know this name? I know um, the name. But that's all I know is the Schumann -esque name. Humanesque kind of or early Mahler kind of style, and I'm right. very fond of the of the piano writing and the the vocal writing as well. I, and was very sad not to have known about her previously. So that's right. that's a composer, Elizabeth, that I would encourage you to check out. Also. And uh, how about um, Alma Mahler? I mean, it's a for famous sure. name, but she's mostly famous for being infamous mm -hmm. um, socially, you know, but she writes terrific music. It's not modern music anymore. It's turn of the century music, but um, wonderful music. Mm -hmm. Those songs are extraordinary. Yep. I don't, I don't have, I wish I could tell you other uh, names, but I don't have them right here. I, does, I, just, I mean, it seems like in, in a way it presents itself as an opportunity to discover more. And I mean, does that excite you? I, I mean, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to be, you know, my age and teaching exactly the same song I taught 50 years ago in the same way, you know, then I'm stagnant and, and probably that gets into the way I present what I want to say, and I don't want to. I don't want to be like that. So yeah, I would like to. I have a few years left to challenge myself, and uh, I would like to do some of that. Martin, we've all been thinking about about repertoire this year for the reasons you just mentioned, and I, I yeah. teach prediction courses at at CCPA and um, some song related graduate seminars, and so I've been really trying to think more consciously about the composers that I represent in those in those classes. And so thinking about the ways that your your teaching has evolved over the decades in terms of either the repertoire that you think about or skills or philosophies that you you impart to your students. Have you seen an evolution in that over the years based on how society shifts or the needs on the other side of academia? or the needs on the other side of the teacher-student relationship. Sure, either. yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure that I'm not as severe and hard on my students as I was when I started this job uh, in 1983. I know that for a fact. Um, 
That's not to say that if they play an eighth note instead of a quarter note, I'm gonna let them get away with it. But the way I don't let them get away with it, I think has changed. I hope so, I really hope so. Um, what I notice is that things have become so convenient for my students now. When, just think about it. I had to look up texts in a, a dictionary. That was it. And there, there was no Google, there was no leader.net, there was no any of those things, right? And these days you go boop, and you know, by the time you retrieve your finger from the computer key, you've got the poem in front of you in as many languages as you want. And I consider that a kind of a curse in a way. Uh, it's harder to memorize when you don't have to do the work. I'm sure Nick would, would bear me out in that. Oh, yes. uh, it doesn't stick as long. And you don't get under the skin of the words and the music uh, as deeply or as, as um, stably, I guess I want to say, when it's all rush, rush, you know? And then of course, let's talk about recordings that are so, I mean, YouTube has changed everything. So how many times a year does somebody say, well, I couldn't find a recording of this. Well, do you read music? That's what I said. That's what I always say, you know? And I, I try to assign something that I know is not on YouTube. Um, just because I want to see is there hope for you know the future with you know if if the hackers instead of attacking a pipeline um, if they attacked Google and we couldn't get all this information we'd have to go back to a dictionary or to actually reading the score um, that's the evolution of the students I feel and I don't know that it would be easy to resist that convenience Shannon you know, if I were going to school right now with all the busy lives that students have, um, gosh, if I can get it in five seconds, why would I want to do in 50 minutes, you know? But there is a price to be paid for that. And there is, uh, here I sound like such an old fogey saying this, but if you learn a piece based on other people's performances that you have listened to, you may think you're not affected by that, but it, that is simply not true. You will never be as you'll never be an empty page once you read that page, you know, or hear that performance. And please, everybody, read the music, come up with your own take on it. And then when you know what you want to do with it, compare it to recordings. And maybe you'll change your mind and do something like a recorded artist has done. Or maybe you'll say, why the hell are they taking it that fast? It's way better at this speed, you know, my speed kind of thing. But we don't need clones. We don't need another uh, website, yeah, any of that stuff. Let, let's go back to a little bit old fashioned hard work. And um, are people leaving this chat? Nick, you have the No, statistics. no, they're, they're, they're still here. Um, hanging in. <laughs> <laughs> I think I hear, I hear you know, the off button being pushed. Um, it really, it, the, the rewards are so much greater when you, when you do the work, you know? So that has not evolved in my teaching. I'd, uh, I don't want to hear that you couldn't learn this piece because it, you couldn't find a recording. I just, if you're singing the songs of the Auvergne in a language that probably 35 people speak in the whole world and you have to listen to a performance to know how to do the diction, okay, that'll, that'll get you off the hook that I have just uh, put you on. But that, that's like, a tenth of one percent of the repertoire. Okay. And actually, I will say to you that there is now a resource where you don't have to listen to a recording. <laughs> you can actually. There's a whole like someone's written a whole thing about it. I'll have to send it to you. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I. I think it'd be just easier to get on Air France and go to the place and listen to people. <laughs> yes, and it would also be much more also pleasant to walk around the Auvergne. <laughs> yeah. Really. <laughs> Oh, I have to say, I was doing a recital years and years ago at the Kennedy Center with Dame Kiri Tekanawa, and the programs didn't arrive, so she had to do all the talking to the audience and announcing things. Um, and she, she was do we were doing a set of Auvergne songs arranged by Condeloupe, and 
she said, uh, this is spoken by people in the middle of France, and she kind of gave the geographical coordinates and said, and I believe there are only 30 or 40 people left who speak this language, and I pray that none of you is here. <laughs> <laughs> I've never forgotten that. Brought the house down. That's so funny. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Those I are think about, sorry, Nick. No, no, I was just gonna say they're extraordinary songs, please, that was. I was just thinking about what you were saying, Martin, about this, this discovery that, that, that's, I think one of the challenges that young singers face is that process of slowing down, grappling with the challenge, right, of singing in a language that is not their own, learning something really from scratch and discovering who they are as an artist through that process. So, you know, well said. I, um, and that's something you'll be pleased to know that, that I do say your words in my studio. So you do have little, and I know that my colleague, Dr. Dana Brown speaks your words also. So you do have some wow. ambassadors out there in the world. Um, but it is a challenge. I think, you know, people are, are afraid to, to make the mistakes, right? And to, I find a lot of young students asking for permission to try something right. that maybe isn't sanctioned by their teacher or by the recording they heard. Their, right. um, so. I, I totally agree. And I would so much rather pull somebody back in 1% degrees from an overdone thing that they gave themselves permission to do than kick their butt in 10% degrees to try to get them to do something, you know, make it your own. How do you feel about this? Mm -hmm. um, don't only tell me how you feel about it, but sing me how you feel about it. And pianist, no words, but play me how you feel about it. Um, I think that's very important. That's, that's something else I stress, by the way, uh, more and more is don't go to the piano to either sight sing the song and see if it suits your voice or play through the song and see how many hours it's gonna take you to learn it at the piano until you have learned the words. I don't mean memorize the words, but uh, you know, what, what is the thing that turned the composer on? Why did he go to the bookstore, buy this book and take delight in this page and decide to set it to music. That was, that's, what does the Bible say? In the beginning was the word, right? I mean, that is really true in this case. And gosh, when I always ask my, my students, have you ever learned a song from the words up rather than the music up and then putting the words on like frosting? Because the words are the cake, they're not the frosting. Um, and once in a while, somebody tries it that way, like they'll say, oh, Mr. Cass, I just learned this song with the poem first, it made such a difference. Um, so if I can, you know, light one little candle, is that what that, that uh, spiritual says? It's better than standing in the dark or something like that. If I can change a few minds about that, I think it's very, very important. We're, you know, we're the only people, those of us, the three of us, and all my students who play for singers, we're the only people who know for sure that our artistic decisions are right because the poem validates it. it. It's like stamped, approved. You know, if you're playing violin, I mean, I adore violin repertoire, but it, you know, is the Kreutzer Sonata happy, sad, demented? I, you know, I don't know what it is. It doesn't have any text. So I have to make all that up for myself. Whereas the words really kind of, I wanna say lock you in, I don't mean in a rigid way, but they put you on the right track immediately before you sight sing anything, you know? Concreteness to it and in terms of the expression. Really, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then you just keep, it's, it reminds me of the arch in St. Louis where they, they, you know, they built it like this and they hoped to, hope to God that the things would meet at the top <laughs> and they did. So you you know, you learn the words and then you learn the music and then you keep adjusting and adjusting until the performance you give is the only way that you can imagine those words being set to music and performed. Um, but that doesn't work if you if you put the words if you leave the words till you know later. You need to jumpstart your imagination, and the poem will do that for you.
Well, it's also a shortcut, right? Because it's like, it gives you a reason as to why the notes are on the page in the first place. Exactly, exactly. We have well, a, talk, oh, talk about oh. sermonizing. I sound like you're preaching to the choir yeah. here. It's fantastic. Choir. We love it. Go ahead, Nick. You said there's a question. I was going to say there's another question from Elizabeth Schumann. This is about going back to informality and venues. Um, she's wondering, considering that, what would your dream song venue be post COVID? My dream song venue? Yes. Let the imagination run wild. Wow. Uh, well, I think maybe my living room. That would be kind of fun. I wouldn't make a lot of money, but uh, isn't that how Schubert tried out all those songs? Uh, I don't know how big his living room was. Um, but we have this adorable concert house here in Ann Arbor. It has nothing to do with the university. It's called Kerrytown Concert House, and it was a house. And then it's been turned into a concert hall that I think maybe seats a hundred people. I'm not, I'm not really sure. And it's in a, a, a weird, it's in an L shape. The audience is in an L shape. So as a performer, as a singer, you're having to like deal with playing both sides of the street in a way. Um, but the, the acoustics are wonderful. It has a German Steinway in it. It's it, everything about it is, is really a dream. And, uh, I was invited to, to play there twice and then COVID hit. I mean, I've played there many, many times, but the last time I was invited, they just had to close the place down. It's too intimate for a COVID environment. But when COVID's gone or when we have this, this elusive thing called herd immunity, um, that I really hope to get back there. Um, that, that's as good a, an environment environment for a song recital as anything I've ever been in. Even Gantz, Shannon, your big auditorium is kind of big for a song recital, don't you think? I agree. Uh, those of you who don't go to Roosevelt University, what does Gantz hold? A thousand people? Oh, it's it's not quite that big. What, 400? Is that right, Nick? Oh, well, it just it looks I think it holds, three. It, looks, it holds about 200, actually. What? I know, but the reason it feels so big is because there's that giant gap between the stage and the audience. And so the first row is like 20 feet back from the piano. Right, right. You could put an orchestra in front of the first row. Okay, I didn't realize that. Yeah. But, um, even, you know, like in Salzburg, they have the Grosses Festspielhaus and the Kleines Festspielhaus. And the Kleines Festspielhaus is a lot like Mendelssohn Auditorium on our campus, where we do this song series every other year. It's, it's uh, the hall is narrow. It's very limited in size. It's just sensational or you can perform in South Park at the Mozarteum which is a you know their music school and that also was a wonderfully small size you can sing triple piano you can play almost inaudibly um yeah you gotta be Avery Fisher Hall what do they call Avery Fisher now Geffen isn't it Geffen Hall in New York what is it called Yes, it's called Geffen Hall, and actually, um, they're in the midst of a big remodel. They, I know, that's only the fourth or fifth time. Imagine, but they're <laughs> doing it for acoustic reasons. It's just too big for a song recital, you know. You can make those things work. I've played many, many concerts at, at Carnegie Hall and the Grosses Festspielhaus in Salzburg and so forth. But then you get to a place like Wigmore Hall in London which is very small. The first thing you feel is terrified that you know every pianist in the audience can see what finger you're using and uh, like you're in a fishbowl or something. But then you, you get used to it after a couple of songs and uh, it's, it's wonderful for this genre of music or a string quartets or you know, something like that. Wigmore is a very special place. And mm -hmm. it is a terrifying place. All those pictures on the wall backstage, it's like, really? Nick, please. <laughs> the, dressing room, the dressing room that the pianists use at Wigmore Hall is the Gerald Moore dressing room. Oh. Come on, he wrote the book on accompanying and collaboration and I'm looking at all these things and I'm getting dressed to go out and play songs that I don't play as well as he played them. Mm, not fun, not fun. <laughs> Oh, but it's a special play room to make music in, that is for sure. Yes, it is, definitely. Speaking of pianists and words, Martin, I don't know if you'll mm. remember this, but when I began in your studio, one of the first things you told me 
was that it was required of your students that they be able to sing and play anything that they brought to a lesson. And I told you in under no uncertain terms that I, I was not going to do that. <laughs> there was no way that that was going to happen. Right. Um, I remember that. I remember, remember that. that. And it did happen. And I'm very grateful that it did. I did, of course, make myself do it. Um, and so I'm certain that's something that has not left your studio. That's no. yeah, it's fundamental. Can you talk more about that? You've, you've talked about it a little bit already, but. I, I've talked about, it. I also devote quite a bit of um, many pages in my, the book that I wrote to that very thing. In, in fact, the very first chapter. Um, I think that playing for a singer, the singer should perceive me as a twin. And I don't mean a twin who just thinks alike, it thinks like the singer thinks, but a, a twin whose body is experiencing things in the same way. And how much time does a breath take? How do I know that if it just remains a cerebral thing that I think about? I, my body has to feel it. I don't have a beautiful voice or, or a strong voice, but I do have a pair of lungs and they breathe the same as yours or Nick's or anybody's. And that is the passport to timing everything and sounding like a human being. And, and uh, very quickly, the singer picks up that he or she has an ally in every way at the piano, rather than somebody just waiting because there's a breath here, somebody is actually breathing because there's a breath here. Um, it, it, those of you who don't play the piano out there, you know that the piano doesn't depend on air for its life. And that is a terrible disadvantage because a pianist can, can play for two hours and never take a breath. And therefore the music never takes a breath. And who wants to hear that? I can hear that in a robot factory, you know? So yeah, that's why I, I, I wanna know what it feels like to say that combination of consonants. I wanna know what it feels like to take that breath. I wanna know what it feels like to have too much breath and I have to make a rest here and I, and I have too much oxygen left in my lungs. All those different things that singers, maybe it's conscious for them and maybe sometimes it's not even conscious for them, but I wanna experience all those things. And even if I'm playing non-vocal music, Shannon, you know, it sounds a little funny when I try to sing a violin sonata or a flute sonata while I'm playing, but I can still do the, the musical impulses, the amount of notes and the amount of rests. I don't have to do, you know, high G above high C just to do a flute sonata, you know? Absolutely. I so, wonder yeah. if, if you have ever had a situation where, of course, this is the ideal. Have you had a, a situation when you've worked with a singer and you've put all of that type of work into the preparation and you find yourself maybe perhaps more invested in language and the shape of the phrase than the singer that you're <laughs> partnering? And how do you, honestly, how do you, how do you manage that? You don't have to name any names. Oh, are you kidding? <laughs> I have found that too often, actually, um, because maybe the singer in question is coming from a place where that was never emphasized. Um, the, how the words taste, how the, what the words mean, what to do in the musical styles from one composer to another. You know, maybe all their training was about vocal technique or projecting their voice or power or whatever, there are a million different things that could be the culprit for that. Um, I don't know that I can solve that just by accompanying that person, you know, uh, especially if I've been hired by that person to play for them, they're not asking me to teach them anything. They're, they're just asking me to partner them. Um, I'm not gonna step up to somebody who's, you know, hired to sing at uh, Kennedy Center and say, by the way, you know, you're breathing, crazy there, why are, you, why are you taking that breath? Uh, I would have to know them pretty well and, and the conversation would have had to pre-exist pre for me to say, would you mind if I, if I say, you know, that, that's really not a very good breath to take. Would you consider taking this instead? Um, but yeah, that, that's why there's a heaven, Shannon, because 
it's not always justifiable down here. You know? <laughs> I hear you. Well, well, as we're nearing the end of our hour here, it, I've asked in the comments if anybody has any questions for you, more questions. Um, so if we want to give them a minute to, if they, in case they have any, but um, as we've been doing these this year, I've, I've sort of developed this habit of uh, asking people this one question, which is, why do you think song is important? And since you are a hallowed guest today, I wonder if you might offer us some thoughts on that. Hallowed, oh my God, never. I've, I've had a lot of adjectives thrown at me, but hallowed, that's a new one. Thank you. Um, so many reasons, Nick. There's, there's no way to uh, exercise your imagination like doing a song. All, you could do 89 opera roles and it wouldn't require the imagination of eight songs. Okay, and I love opera. Please don't, audience, I love opera. You'll see me at the lyric, don't worry, okay? <laughs> but songs are a different thing. Um, it's like meat and fish or gelato and sorbetto or something, okay? Um, it's great discipline to have to deal with the, the challenges of language and, and demanding musical scores. Those are, why not discipline ourselves? We get, we get better with that kind of adversity, you know? Um, also songs, as we've already discussed tonight, are kind of the underdog. Let's, let's hear it for the underdog. Let's prop up the underdog, you know, in terms of marketability and uh, see if we can resuscitate it as much as possible and not go to our graves thinking we didn't do anything. CCAIC is already doing something. So you guys don't have to worry. People will visit your graves, it's okay. Um, why else do songs? Because they say so much more personal things about you. Um, I'm never gonna be, you know, a tenor like Nick, you could go out to sing Radames, but you're never gonna be that general from Egypt. You're just pretending to be that general from Egypt, okay? But you could sing Dein Blaues Auge by Brahms, which talks about my previous love was a bad one, was, a, was, was a, one that burned me and now I'm with you and life is like a lake that is so clear, I, I just can't believe it. Well, think what you could bring to that. You can bring everything that you've experienced romantically or non-romantically, you know, it, you don't have to be a general in Egypt to, you know, to sing that song. You can be you. Um, a woman waiting for her husband to come back from the war and she goes outside and what do you know, there's a pair of birds singing over her head. And normally she would find that uh, a sweet sound, but what, what, is she, what bothers her is that it's a pair of birds, a husband and wife bird, and she doesn't have a husband now. So that, I mean, any, any lady who has ever lost someone can identify with that, you know, that's, I don't know, I, I want to call it the universal donor, like a blood type, because it's so open to different contexts, what you bring to it. I think it's very important. Uh, so it kind of speaks softly, but very powerfully to people, I think. And, and a lot of other kind of music is powerful, Loud, powerful, loud, powerful is easy, you know? Um, soft, powerful is not so simple, you know? I think it's important to, to exercise that muscle. For sure. Beautiful okay. words. That is a wonderful answer, thank you. I'm like so moved by that. And I, I think you're right, you know, soft, the sort of soft power is the one that penetrates more at the end of the day, I think, because people haven't been bludgeoned with, <laughs> you know, it's, that it's been allowed to seep in. And that's beautiful, yeah. really beautiful. Uh, it looks as though our questions are done from Facebook. So okay, um, yeah. thank you so much for joining us today. And Shannon. I loved doing it. Loved thank it. you. Um, and uh, good luck with your next season of CAIC. Um, I look forward to seeing an announcement about what's coming up. So do we. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And exactly. who knows, maybe I'll come back to Roosevelt when, when they are accepting guests in person. Absolutely, we would love to see you in both places, at CAIC and at CCPA. Thanks so much. Absolutely, thank you, thank you so, so much, Martin. Facebook, we are gonna be off next week, but we are back May 27th again with Shannon hosting and our guest will be soprano Lynn Eustace. And um, otherwise we'll see you soon, Facebook. And thank you, Martin, so, so much. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. So good to see you. Bye. 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 Oh, this is where I have to figure out how to turn this off. There we go. Oh. Okay. <laughs>